Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And thank you so much for joining me today. And our today's uh, topic as you already know, is cosmopolitanism, internationalism, and transculturalism. And uh, this topic was actually suggested by one of the participants last week. So uh, out of all these terms, I mean, of course, I have dealt with all of them as a scholar and as a professor. And they are interconnected and overlapping, but they also have their own distinct meanings. And so I'll try to go over the terms a little bit and what do they mean for me and how I employ them. And then we'll see if there are any questions from the audience and I'll try to answer those as best as I can. So um, the term cosmopolitanism is actually the most used term in contemporary social sciences, but also humanities. And there is a reason for it because it is always juxtaposed against nationalism, right? And it is somehow always thought a relative term to internationalism, okay? The major theorists are quite a few, actually the person whose work I have followed throughout is Bruce Robbins and Fang Chia. And this is the book, their uh, edited collection, Cosmopolitics, that I have taught a number of times. And there are certain reasons because of which I prefer Bruce Robbins, for example, over Fang Chia, uh, not Fang Chia, Anthony Appiah and other people. Uh, it's because I believe that the way uh, Robbins approaches the concept of cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitics along with Feng Chia is more nuanced and creates space within it for non-Eurocentric ways of thinking cosmopolitanism. Now, a lot of scholars of cosmopolitanism you know, they draw the lineage of the concept from different historical frames, different historical precedences. Some draw it from, for example, if you've read Anthony Appiah's book on cosmopolitanism, it's a good book. Uh, I don't recommend that you should just buy into it ipso facto, read it critically, because I, I was uh, troubled by its deep, latent Eurocentricity. Uh, but the scholars like Apia, they draw the history of cosmopolitanism from the Sophist tradition, from the Greek tradition. And Sophists, who were often derided by Plato, Plato and others, were these itinerant philosophers who didn't owe any allegiance to any city-state, right? And that's the philosophers from whom they draw the concept of cosmopolitanism because the first and foremost aspect of any cosmopolitanist thinking is that you don't claim a national identity or if you do, you consider it fluid because to be cosmopolitan literally means beyond the pulls and pressures of the place where you live or the nation that you belong to. So that's what, roughly speaking, cosmopolitanism means. And some scholar draw it from the sophists. Now, Bruce Robbins and Feng Chia and quite a few others draw on one particular work of Kant, right, which is called Perpetual Peace. <clears throat> it's a small pamphlet. It's available online. Please do read it. Now, in Perpetual Peace, what Kant tries to do is to theorize a world right, a cosmopolitan world beyond nation states. And he writes it as a constitution. He doesn't only think that it's imperative for the world to develop into a larger cosmopolitan political structure. He doesn't imagine a world state, right? But what he imagines is how would people from one part of the world and the other part of the world live together in peace without needing armies and without coercing each other. And that's the lineage which Bruce Robbins and other draw for cosmopolitanism. 
Now, what Bruce Robbins also suggests is that a lot of theorists assume that nationalism exists and we must develop cosmopolitanism. But his idea is that nationalism is actually a latecomer. Cosmopolitanism existed before that. I mean, even if you look at the old empires, in so many ways they were cosmopolitan because you could travel across a vast expanse of space. And even though you came across people who were ethnically, religiously different from you, you could think of them as your own fellow human beings. I mean, travels of Ibn Battuta is a great example, right? Think of it, he's from Africa, he travels all over the world all over the Abbasid empire and can relate to people on a certain level where it's not determined by where he himself comes from. Then Robbins also talks about actually existing cosmopolitanism. He talks about the, the, the affinity that Muslims all over the world have towards each other. Similarly, Christian cosmopolitanism, which can go beyond the nation state where people can feel affinity for fellow Christians living elsewhere in the world. The diasporic uh, Jewish diaspora and the cosmopolitan nature of it. So these are some of the aspects of the cosmopolitanism that Bruce Robbins and Feng Chia discuss. Now, why is there a need for it? Because they see the nation state as not necessarily a positive force in the world, but increasingly a force that forces us to think in national terms and then always consider an other, right? An enemy or someone upon whom we can impugn all our failures. I mean, and so at the height of it, the chauvinistic nationalism, that's the kind of identity that it creates and that built into it then is this animosity towards our others. The purpose of refocusing on cosmopolitanism is to take out that aspect of looking at other human beings, right? To see our fellow human beings living elsewhere in the world as our equal participants in life on this planet, because so much depends on it. How we treat each other depends on it, but saving the planet depends on it if we think beyond the nation. So those are some of the rough ideas about cosmopolitanism. Uh, the book is really amazing. There's a wonderful chapter by Feng Chia, which gives you the critique of hybridity as theorized by Baba and James Clifford, right? And the critique is based in, okay, how do they imagine hybridity, but who do they think as hybrid subjects, right? These people who have crossed certain borders and can live in the West. So what happens to the people who cannot escape the very givens of their post-colonial cultures, right? How do we think of them? So that's really also part of this book. Now, internationalism obviously is of different kinds. Right. So the most prominent, of course, was the Marxist internationalism. Right. So originally, you know, the proletariat was supposed to be cosmopolitan. Right. The idea of a global proletariat presupposed that there will be no national affiliations. Now that got destroyed after the First World War. Right. Because, you know, the workers from different nations were killing each other during the war, despite the fact that they shared the same human conditions. So Marxist internationalism then builds on the third international, right? And the idea that, okay, we can have nations, but we can develop a sort of internationalism where we work together as socialistic nations, where workers from one part of the world can work in collaboration with workers from other parts of the world. Right uh, now, the current example of that kind of internationalism is a, we have seen on the left post 1980s activism is, is how unions work. Sometimes what happens is that if a union is striking here in United States and if they are weak, they find out that they are working for a huge corporation and they have a huge subsidiary in London, right? So then they will reach out to the local union in London of the same company, maybe in a different business, and they will ask them, hey, would you strike in solidarity with us? So that's a certain kind of socialistic internationalism where we can still be in a national space and work 
with people elsewhere. So overall, cosmopolitanism could be a feeling, could be a politics, could be a way of life, and same for internationalism. Now, for internationalism, of course, there are also official mechanisms, right? There is the United Nations. There is the World Court. If you want to go by the economic structures, there are the Bretton Woods institutions, right? Um, the World Bank, the IMF, the GATT. Then there are regional organizations. You know, if you are in South Asia, it's SARC, right? Further to the east is ASEAN, right? Uh, European Union, all of these organizations are internationalist organizations. There's another thing which a lot of these scholars don't really talk about, just as cosmopolitanism and internationalism is driven towards peace, right? Because the presupposition is that if we think in national terms and create our others and impugn onto them, all our failures. So nationalism then promotes this kind of exclusivity that creates these enmities in the world, right? And if we eliminate that, maybe we can develop a world. There are quite a few problems with that. I mean, first of all is we have to keep in mind the global inequalities. Even if we open the borders, which they are in terms of global trade, whose interest does it still serve? Right? There's a beautiful book by Timothy Brennan, who is a critic of globalization, right? And you can watch my lecture on globalization, what we talked about. So his point of view, which I partially agree with, is that in so many cases, since the multinational corporations are so powerful, global institutions are so intrusive into the economies of the developing world, maybe we do need a strong socialistic nation state, right? Which can protect the interests of their own people against the intrusions of global capital, right? Because if the governments are not doing that and they have privatized everything, then whose interest are they serving? So we have to think about terms like internationalism and even cosmopolitanism also from a post-colonial perspective and ask ourselves, you know, whose interest does it serve if the borders are open, right? Are they actually open? Yes, for certain nations and certain countries. But people who come from, you know, my country and my region or look like me, there is no open world for us. And that's the fact, okay? Uh, so all these concepts are useful in theory and we use them. <clears throat> but a uh, more subtle use of them would be to put these concepts themselves, you know, under a challenge, you know, pose them the same kind of questions. Okay, you're talking about cosmopolitanism, it is good, but it is still deeply Eurocentric structurally, but also philosophically. And then there is this really troubling kind of cosmopolitanism and post-nationalism or internationalism. Uh, that is, I mean, you, you see the terroristic organizations are all post-national, right? You look at ISIS, read my book on it, look at even the Taliban, they are deeply transnational, multinational, right? Their reach is global. Their membership is post-national. So part of it is there is a dark side to, to it. Similarly, I mean, if there's a wonderful essay in this book by Benedict Anderson, who talks about the diaspora nationalism in opposition to post-nationalism and cosmopolitanism. And what his observation is, and I think it is true, is that a lot of diasporic communities living in United States, Canada, elsewhere, in their way of connecting to their mother or fatherland or a native country, they tend to support the most reactionary forces over there. And he gives you the example uh, of some of the very strong advocates of state of Israel in the United States, who, when they think of Israel and support Israel, actually support the most right-wing politicians in Israel. Similarly, uh, Indian diaspora in the United States, uh, 
majority of them who are wealthy, right, and have resources support BJP, right, uh, and Hindu fundamentalists. So another interesting thing happens in that kind of cosmopolitanism that these people, these constituencies, even though they live in the so-called liberal democracies, what they want to preserve in their former nations are the structures of identity that are majoritarian. And so that's also another interesting thing to read in cosmopolitanism and internationalism and post-nationalism. Now, transculturalism, I mean, as I said, all of these terms are somehow loosely related, uh, is an interesting term. But the term was introduced by Fernando Ortiz, right, in 1978, in tracing the lives the cultures that develop in the Caribbean and especially the development of Afro-Caribbean culture, right? And then its theorization within the colonial context is of course, Mary Louis Pratt, right? Her book, Imperial Eyes, right? And Pratt theor further builds on the term and calls it transculturation, right? And transculturation for her is the phenomena that happens in what she calls the contact zones. Now, contact zones for Mary Louis Pratt are actual colonial situations, situations over here where there are diasporic communities, right? Where different groups come together. That's a contact zone. Now, in the colonial sense, a contact zone was already inherently unequal, right? So what ends up happening is that the colonizers bring their own culture, right? And with their interactions with the native culture, some form of transculturation happens. But also their own culture is impacted by the native customs and traditions. And if that happens, that is transculturation, right? Which is kind of another form of what Baba calls hybridity. But the problem in that exchange always is that one group has dominance over the other, okay? And it's because of that dominance that an act of transculturation is never really equal, right? Now, transculturalism as a concept is also offered in opposition to terms like multiculturalism. Now, if you really want to go into the questions of multiculturalism and cultural difference, uh, Homi Baba's location of culture has a wonderful discussion of it where he critiques the concept of multiculturalism and proposes cultural difference. Now, transculturalism also falls in the same category in one sense. If you think of transculturalism, what you're assuming is that different cultures come together, enrich each other, and hence every culture becomes transcultural. The problem with similarly thinking multiculturalism is that what you're assuming is that multiculturalism is a culture in which different cultures exist, but you're still assuming one culture which is multicultural and that tends to be the dominant culture. If you think in terms of cultural difference, then you can have a culture in which different cultures can exist, right, as equal. So transculturalism then, thinking of transculturalism, one has to keep in mind the inherent equalities of the inequalities of the contact zone. And then if you're reading some space or some area as transcultural, you have to ask yourself, which dominant strain is defining this transculturalism, right? Uh, do the natives have a voice in this transculture or has their culture been overwritten? By and large, the biggest critique of it would be that what comes out might be how hybrid, but in that still a certain cultural strain has a dominant position, right? It, cannot, it doesn't necessarily have to be former colonizers if when the nation states form after the independence of colonial uh, societies, within that also a transculture is created, but they always are governed by either a dominant language, a dominant community, or a dominant ethnicity. 
So within that, transculturalism then would be to infuse the dominant culture with the voices, culture, languages, and traditions of those who are on the periphery of it. You can see the examples of it in Africa, where one ethnic group, let's say, comes into power and forms a political party. You can see the examples of it in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in pretty much every colonial society. When the new politics emerges, there are always certain dominant constituencies who shape the culture of that nation. And everyone else is expected to either aspire to it or learn. A transcultural society would acknowledge that there are different cultures that exist, and each culture would have a space as an equal participant in that culture. So these are some of the ideas that I have on these concepts. Uh, of course, I can't really cover all of them. So cosmopolitanism already presupposes a world in which nation state loyalties do not exist, where we can see each other as equal humans with others and maybe feel empathy and sympathy and love for our global others. Internationalism or post-nationalism is the idea of either thinking in terms of international relations as equal or post-nationalism where we can have loyalties which are not just related to nationalism. Both of these have existed historically, still exist in different forms. And transculturalism, different connotations, but by and large, where we can assume that every culture is transcultural. But within that, a certain hierarchy of power still exists. Right. So these are some of my ideas on these three topics. Um, now, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer those. Put your question first. Are internationalism and in, no, they are not the same. Uh, I just didn't have enough space to put both the terms. So transnationalism already presupposes the way of thinking the world beyond the nation. Right? Internationalism works within the structure of nations. So if you look at United Nations, it's an internationalist organization, World Health Organization, because they already assume that nations are the largest political entities that they exist, and internationalism builds in its, itself this idea of national relationships. Transnationalism is more, uh, is closer to cosmopolitanism because the idea is to imagine a world beyond nation. And even if you live in a nation state, having transnational sympathies and identities. Can you explain, Homi, how do you isolate cultures within a larger web of cultures? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't think so. I have a convincing answer for that. What he's trying to critique, and I will do a separate lecture on it because it's a really dense chapter. What he's trying to critique in terms of usage of term multiculturalism and cultural difference basically is that multiculturalism presupposes that a culture can exist which can contain different cultures. But at the end of the day, all those cultures are subsumed within the interest of a larger culture, right? which calls itself multicultural. The idea of cultural difference then, it enables us to say, yes, I exist in this culture, but we, we still acknowledge different cultures within a culture, right? And we learn to love each other and respect each other without effacing that cultural difference. So if you live in America, right, expecting Spanish speaking people to um, if America is multicultural, it will say, Masood Raja, you are from Pakistan, you shouldn't speak Urdu, that's not American. The question of cultural difference would be, you live in America, you follow its laws, we don't care which language you speak, you're American man. Because you're accepting me as an American citizen without effacing the, the difference, there is no need for me to give up something to become American because America can sustain that. That's the idea. Uh, so cultural difference, when we look at things and people in terms of cultural distance, difference, what we are saying is we acknowledge you are different, but that's okay. That's the subtle difference that he's talking about. 
but as i said it's a really dense chapter and and i'll probably have to reread it and then do a separate talk on that thank you for that question though okay what are the consequences of this trans culture on children especially in case of colonial periods of algeria uh well i mean if you want to see how it impacted algerians right um you should read asia jabar's so was the prison uh and then of course fanon he's not an algerian but he becomes one so read fanon's uh, uh reading of what happens to you know arab identities within the colonial system but to answer it more convincingly i think someone who's done a wonderful job of uh, explaining what happens to children through a edu colonial educational system is nogugi tiango right in decolonizing the mind uh, where he talks about the colonial educational system as a mode of creating a certain specific passive subjectivity and what he would share what he shares with you is the experience of going to school as a rural kid right so the kids will go to school and they will be told that they can only speak in english right and then at the beginning of the class the teacher would give one student a little token and say pass it on to someone who speaks gikuyu or yoruba right fine so by the end of the class the teacher will ask who has the token right so then through a chain of narration they will find out who gave it to whom so they'll have a line of kids standing there or all of them had passed it to the other because they spoke yoruba or gikuyu right and then those kids will be humiliated for using a dialect now what ngugi uh, explains is that what it did to the children was certain things they internalized certain things what first of all that english is the language of power we have to learn it to succeed in this culture that goes without saying every colonial society that was something everyone expected but two they also learn to consider their own culture as inferior as something if they practiced could get them in trouble so that was a deep psychological trauma of starting to see their own culture as primitive from the point of view of the colonizer now if you have read a little more african literature there is a wonderful set of poems by pibetic right the song of lavino and others which encapsulates this debate between the wife and a husband how does a husband start seeing his own culture so the damage to children was then psychologically speaking they start seeing their own culture in from the point of view of the colonizers right and become suspicious of it think it is primitive think it is not modern enough and since they lose that cultural basis right then all the identity that ha they have is structured through the colonial system and when that ident identity is shattered there is nothing to fall back on remember that was the crisis that uh, fanon had to go through when he goes from martinique to france right and someone points to him and says oh a black man and he had never thought of himself as a black man right he had always thought of himself as a french man so when that identity shatters he has nothing else to fall back on so that's how i think uh that kind of unequal transculturalization impacts children right and then as they grow up but i would recommend black skin white masks it's not algerian but you know you don't need algerian works only to understand algeria uh because it kind of traces with its own problems the the construction of the colonized psyche Okay, thank you. Yeah, I I got these next week, so thank you. Are you uh, critique? If so, can you elaborate? No, I can't elaborate on it. I'm absolutely familiar with her critique. I have the book right here, uh, but it's it's too huge a topic to just answer in a question, right? 
but you also always have to understand when a critic criticizes cosmopolitanism, the first thing to read in that is what are they saying cosmopolitanism means to them, right? And I can promise you, even without rereading her book, that her critique would come from a point of view that it's Eurocentric, that it doesn't take into account the particularities of local cultures, and that it doesn't take into account the global division of labor. That was her critique of uh, Deleuze and Foucault as well, right? And, and then multinational cult capital, how does it work? And that cosmopolitanism erases that. I can promise you all of those things would be in her critique. Um, Okay, why some modern nation states inspired by some theological, theological actors resist multi... Uh, well, I mean, that's a very big question, right? Uh, I would say that even states that claim to be secular, you know, are deeply driven by religious ideology. America is one great example of that. Uh, religion in so many ways religions are also cosmopolitan, right? I mean, if you look at Catholic Church, the whole concept of Catholica means, you know, the world. Similarly, Islamic internationalism. Why do they want to force that on others? I mean, it works as a political strategy, right? They can mobilize a group of people who can follow them. Religion is a great tool in doing that. Uh, some people have a nostalgic view of history. They think of their past empires and they think that they can reenact those. I mean, there are different reasons. All of those reasons are geared towards either imagining a glorious past and then reenacting it or just simply mobilizing a pre-nationalist concept within the national main, uh, frame to mobilize people. And always it presupposes that if you're focusing on one religion, it has to then create its others, right? Whosoever they may be globally or locally, right? And, uh, and, and religion is a great way of also creating those kind of zones of exclusivity where you can sit down and tell yourself, everyone is, else is lost and I have the truth and I will be saved, right? But why do nation states do that? I mean, I mean, it's it's a very hard question to answer because there are quite a few nation states that use religion as a political tool and each one has their own reasons. But one thing you can so say is that it is always about control, about controlling power, about mobilizing people to your cause. If it's a democracy, that's how it will be used. If it's an an autocratic system, then that's the system that sustains and rationalizes their power. So look at Saudi Arabia and Iran. These are the two poles of Islamic world. Uh, these are both theocracies, right? One uses the Wahhabi faction of Islam as its ideology of rationalization. The other uses the Shia Islam as its ideology of rational, that, that's in dictatorships, right? In United States, it's mostly Protestant Christianity, right? If you look at Mr. Trump's rise to power, one strong constituency that he relies on is the, is the evangelical Christians, right? So they over-determine what he will and will not do, but then he will ponder, pander to them as well. And in the process of doing that, he will use the vocabularies that they use, say things that mean something to them. So they are over determining his political and his politics. So that's happening in a democracy. If you go to India, BJP is a Hindu majoritarian party. I mean, they are not anti-India, but they have this idea of India as Hindu. That's what they are pandering to. That's their political base. And that's what they would try to sh shape India into, right? So all of these nation states, whether they are democratic or autocratic, use religion for different purposes, but mainly to stay in power, right? And to keep people under control. Uh, 
Pakistan and India do share because once they were geographically, which areas such sharing? The, absolutely. Uh, I absolutely believe that. I mean, I talk to people from both countries and absolutely, I mean, it's not just we share a history. It's the way we say things, the way we talk to each other. First of all, we share a pre-colonial history and then we share a colonial history together. Uh, actually, of all the nations in the world that has a belligerent status towards each other, India and Pakistan are the ones that have an easiest path to, you know, becoming friends and becoming actually a confederacy, right? Uh, I, I am a strong proponent of that. As a scholar, I, I always say that if you're going to think, you know, think dangerously. So like a world in which India and Pakistan and Bangladesh can sit together along with Nepal, Bhutan and Sri Lanka, where they can sit together and say, hey, it's we've been fighting each other for a long time. Let's sit together and build a confederacy where each one of us is an autonomous state, but we also have a central parliament and work together and, and you know, our differences. So yeah, absolutely, they share a lot in common. Uh, Okay, OS, I will try to do that, even though that is not yet my area of expertise. But yeah, Pakistani literature in English, I have a couple of essays on it. Um, but uh, I will absolutely try to do that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm just scanning it through if I missed anyone's uh, questions. So yeah, no, I, I haven't. So let me see, Munazza. Okay, cosmopolitanism seems to be more in vogue in developed capitalistic societies, while the third world remains mired in global religion. Why is, is it so? What is the role of cap? That's a really good question. I disagree that it's in vogue in the developed worlds, because if you look at what's happening in United States, actually, we are in a reversal. I mean, United States is becoming more and more isolationist, right? more and more nationalistic, same with, with United Kingdom. So the two major powers in the West in the West have already elected to realign their national identities. United States has withdrawn from most international agreements, right? Even World Health, Health Organization. As a concept, it's more in vogue because we have scholars who think about it. And maybe they have the liberty to think about it. And of all of them, Bruce Robbins would already tell you that we have a privileged location. He would tell you one thing that he wants scholars to learn is to know of their own privilege and unlearn it. And he calls it the view from above. And he has another book, which is called Feeling Global, which traces the origin of this European way of looking at the world, which he calls the aerial view, where they go and see these places from above. Right. Uh, the developing world, yeah, they have their own national strifes and they have to deal with global capital. In one sense, they are global because they are responsive to the global imperatives. They are caught within the web of neoliberal capital. Right. And they are trying to train their populations to be successful in a deeply globalized world. On the other hand, as I already said, the relationship is unequal. Right financially and economically. And as a result, what's happening in the developing world, what's happening in the African nation state, and that's a huge um, debate, but uh, increasingly the states are becoming security states since they can no longer fulfill the promise of delivering goods to their people, welfare to their people, because of their own economic constraints. It's not just because of corruption. So what they increasingly do is they militarize the police, they, they militarize the nation, right? And securitize the state, right? That's what is happening in India. Like Mr. Modi has not been able to solve the poverty problem, but God forbid if, you know, someone says anything against gods and religion, because that's an easy symbolics to mobilize. Same goes to Pakistan. Uh, you know, uh, we can't solve people's problem, don't, can't give them food, but we can string up a few politicians because they're corrupt. 
and uh, destroy the political parties in the process, but that sells, right? Uh, the better solution is in internationalism. You know, how would the developing nations argue that their debts should be forgiven, not through bilateral negotiations. They don't have enough symbolic power or material power to do that. But if 100, you know, 120 of the developing nations come together and say, we will all stop paying interest on our IMF debt, then you have a voice, right? And that solution will never come from simply me being India and me being Pakistan, that will come through a coalition of developing nations who know what the problem is, what the global inequalities are, and then argue together, right? But what cuts across is this nationalism and religion and ethnicity. I'm really with your answer and suggest, I will re good, thank you, please do. And uh, as I said, Munazza, uh, uh, I hope I answered your and role of capital and religion, of course, I mean, that's, you should uh, watch like the one we did on neoliberal capital a few weeks ago, it's available on our channel. But that was the debate there, you know, the inequality of neoliberal capital and how you know, the North Atlantic regions still over determine what happens in the global periphery. Right? But I would say that based in our discussion today, having a way of thinking in cosmopolitanist term, based in our discussion today, having a way of thinking in cosmopolitanist terms beyond the nation state, in transnational terms, right? Knowing the implications in doing so is still a better option if we think of our global others, right? As fellow human beings, as those with whom we share this planet and its resources, it's still better than just thinking that I'm a Muslim and I'm a Pakistani and I'm a Hindu and I'm from India, because that creates these zones of exclusivity and there is no possibility of reaching across there. And I think that would be a better thing for the world. Sadly though, the country where I live is already become increasingly xenophobic and, and now we have reached a stage where the mighty president of united states has no qualms about talking in racial terms and deriding ethnic minorities and other religions but that teaches us another thing is the fragility of history itself, right? We always think that we have fought these battles and changed the world. And then you see power in wrong hands in wrong constituencies can undo, you know, decades of cultural work in one or two political decisions. I mean, think of India, right? I, I consider still that India is one of the miracles of the post-colonial world, right? How? It has its problems, poverty, Kashmir, everything. But here was a country with the most diverse population, with the huge land mass and diverse population, which wrote a constitution, followed it through, and has had uninterrupted democracy. It's not perfect, of course, some of them are corrupt, right? But a functional democracy for more than 70 years with the world's, I think, 10th largest industrial base, with one of the world's most educated workforce, despite the fact that poverty, right? That's why I call it a miracle, right? What was that built on? Acknowledging that India is a multi-racial, multi-ethnic, transcultural, society and writing it with a few weaknesses in the constitution, right? Now here comes along a political party, Bharatiya Janta Party, which thinks that to make India great, its Hindu identity must be constantly highlighted and enforced. Now that is a recipe for India's destruction in my mind. Why? Because what made it succeed was that cosmopolitan view of the nation. 
right? A view of the nation which was nuanced enough to include Muslims, to include the Dalit population, Christians, Parsis, and everyone else, right? If you destroy that, you're basically cutting off the basis upon which the edifice of modern India was built, right? But no, right? Think of it, 70 years to build all that, and then two decades to undo it, right? That's how fragile these systems can be, right? In the, and that's how easily they can be undone. On the other hand, I mean, it gives us hope that maybe with enough work and enough commitment by different people, uh, something new can be built, right? So as a scholar and student of literature and nationalism and cosmopolitanism, you know, I, I tend to be optimistic. My hope is always that if more and more of us constantly keep speaking on these issues, keep writing about these issues, um, and, and keep acknowledging each other's humanity, right? Then maybe we can change the world, right? Because the alternative is what people are already doing and that's not really good. And we haven't even talked about the environment, right? So, okay, um, Mandeep ji, conduct a session on nostalgia. Okay, that would be good. Maybe I'll put it on my list, right? Nostalgic literature. There can be so many different kinds of it, you know, religious nostalgia, national nostalgia. Um, I will put that on the list. Well, that's uh, pretty much all I have, unless there are any other questions. So we have briefly talked about cosmopolitanism transnationalism and internationalism, and then transculturalism, right? They are interconnected, but different concepts in different terms. And I hope this was useful to you. I have not decided the topic for our next uh, webinar next Saturday. Um, but uh, I think what I will do is uh, probably just do an open question answer session and that will give me a break from preparing but also give you a chance to ask questions openly uh, Thomas Proust I would love to do it but it will take a lifetime to do it uh, because you know how many volumes of the translation there are uh, but uh, anyway that's what I'm planning to do meanwhile I I have a couple of suggestions uh, already to think about and plan uh, down the road some other webinars. Uh, but I'm hoping that next week we can do just simply a question answer session for about 50 minutes, an hour. And I will take the questions beforehand. You can even post them under this video when it goes live uh, on the YouTube channel or just, you know, post them in any comments on the YouTube channel. And then uh, we'll see how that one goes. And then I'm hoping that through those questions will come certain other topics that we can develop and then we can talk about. Idea is to share thoughts together. And it my purpose is never to offend anyone. But if I have, uh, I, please do forgive me. But thank you so much for joining me. And I will join, see you next week. And I hope you send me some questions. All right. Goodbye and peace and love.